Let's talk about some Inquisitors, Navy Breachers and Assassins with a look at the Agents of the Imperium rules for 10th edition 40k. Looks like the authority of the Inquisition is reaching further than ever before, allowing them to give some big buffs to any Imperium battle line unit. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics, where today we're doing a review of Games Workshop's new preview for the Agents of the Imperium, one of the index sets that's going to work a bit differently to the rest of them, as they're more the allies and agents that go alongside other Imperium armies, as opposed to a full army in their own right. The Inquisition and Assassins are an army set that's had more or less representation in rules over the years. Recently though, with the release of a whole bunch of Kill Team type kits, their numbers have swelled a bit in terms of different units that they can field. Now this mini army represents the Inquisition, Assassins, Rogue Traders, Navy Breachers and the Adeptus Arbites. In the past, Games Workshop have confirmed that these are going to be getting their own data card set along with the other indexes of 10th edition and they had shown off their basic army construction rules which I think now maybe make a bit more sense now we've seen the full army construction rules and a good idea of what most factions are going to be getting in terms of their units and general feel of them. In this preview, they told us about the rules for inclusion in an army Datasheet previews for Inquisitor Greyfax, a Standard Inquisitor, the Navy Breachers and a Vindicare Assassin and they also gave us a few ideas as to how Inquisitors will be working and confirmed that rules will be present for currently sold named Inquisitors, things like Karamazov, Kotiaz and Eisenhorn. I guess that the recently sold Forge World ones like Hector Rex might well be going to Legends. First up, perhaps one of the most interesting things about these guys is how they slot into your army. The preview article maybe wasn't entirely clear as to whether or not they could actually be legally fielded as a standalone force. In one part of the article they basically said that it sounds like you could, and in another part it basically sounded like you couldn't. In the free text designers commentary at the end of the article they said you could field an army of them, even if the general focus of them isn't really supposed to be made that way. They do share their faction keyword, Agents of the Imperium, though I guess with the units available it will be a bit of a mishmash of characters and light infantry though perhaps not unplayable at smaller points levels perhaps. However though, earlier in the article they did say that Imperial agents aren't designed to operate as a faction in their own right, you'll find no detachment rules, stratagems or enhancements within this index, which to me kind of sounds like you wouldn't really be able to field a whole army of them. In the army construction rules you need to have a faction and a detachment to draw from. If the agents of the Imperium don't have a detachment, I guess that means that you wouldn't be able to field them in a match play game even if you really wanted to. Obviously in more casual games you can certainly bend or break any rule, but given that they've implied that there's no detachment for these guys, it probably means that you wouldn't be able to field a whole army of them even if you did want to field that weird mix of forces. I think you could still go about making a fairly good themed force if you wanted to, maybe build around Sisters of Battle or Grey Knights and then make heavy use and then make heavy use of a few of the more powerful Inquisitor characters or retinues. Perhaps Guard Scions or Death Watch could also be good fluffy options. For the primary way that they're intended to be played though, we have this assigned agent special rule. I think this is a rule section that we've seen previewed before, and it basically scales the amount of allied characters and retinues as per the game size. They say that you can take a number of agents of the Imperium units as per this chart depending on the game size, and it doesn't matter if they don't share a faction keyword with your main force. In games of incursion you can take up to one character and up to one retinue, at games of strike force it's up to two characters and up to two retinue units, and for Onslaught it's up to three of each. They also say that you can't have the different assassins as your warlord, and also I noticed that the Vindicare assassin has the epic hero keyword on his datasheet, so it means that as per the army construction rules you can't actually field more than one of the same type. I know at least some people will have more than one of the same assassin type, but unfortunately for those it looks like you can't have more than one Vindicare assassin in your army for example. That aside though, the allowance of units seems at least fairly generous as per allied rules. At say a 2000 point game of Warhammer 40k, you could for example have an Inquisitor, an Assassin, a squad of Adeptus Arbites and a squad of Navy Breachers. That might be around about 400 points just as one example fielding. And I believe that you'd be able to do this as well as an allied knight as well. So you could have a fairly decent combined arms imperial force there. With the Allied Knight as well, you could have something like 800 points of models that didn't come from your codex, maybe even more. If you're including these in your army, it's very much going to be the raw strength of your datasheets, or obviously just lore and theming. Looks like including the datasheets won't stop any of your own army rules from functioning, say Space Marines getting their Oath of Moment or anything like that, but they also won't benefit from that rule either. I think most of those faction special rules tend to specify the targets of them, say Adeptus Astartes units. 
It also doesn't look like the Inquisition or the agents will be bringing any unique stratagems or enhancements of their own. It very much is just going to be the raw data sheets, as with the Allied Knight data sheet that you can field. Let's actually take a look at the data sheets then, and we've got no less than four of them: Greyfax, an Inquisitor, some Navy breaches, and a Vindicare. Perhaps one of the most interesting things that I thought about the preview was that apparently Inquisitors can join any Imperium battle line unit, as well as presumably the retinue units out of the agents of the Imperium. That's got some definite interesting possibilities there. As a leader, they'd be able to provide boosted leadership, maybe to lower leadership Imperium forces. Greyfax here has a mighty leadership of 4+, plus, which is pretty crazy. Somehow better than Reboot A. Gilliman's, which does seem a bit odd. The Inquisitors do seem to have some sort of buff that they give to their unit as well, and this could be really quite interesting, getting access to buffs that are outside your codex, and maybe the units might have not been 100% designed with them primarily intended. It also seems that the Inquisitors still have that authority of the Inquisition rule that allows them to also embark on a transport that their attached unit can get into. For Greyfax's raw stats, it looks like she's lost one wound, but otherwise seems fairly similar on the stat line. That leadership of 4+, plus, I must admit, is slightly surprising. So far, I don't think that we've seen anything that was better than a 5+, plus, including Abaddon and Gilliman. It seems a bit weird that she'd somehow be better than them, even if the Inquisition is famously self-assured. Otherwise, the interesting things about Greyfax are her ranged attacks and buffs, and her ranged attacks in particular seem to be extra good at sniping characters, particularly Psykers. Castigation looks like it's a fairly powerful single shot witch fire attack. One attack at 18 inches, strength 8, AP minus 2, and damage 3, hitting on a 3 plus. It's got devastating wounds, so a smaller chance for mortals just normally, but it's also got precision, so you could target leaders out of a unit, and also the anti character 4 plus rule, which means that if you rolled a 4 plus, then that character would take 3 mortal wounds. Pretty brutal, and that does seem like a genuine threat to any leaders that she gets line of sight to. Even if not, it's not a terrible single shot to have against heavy infantry. Her other shooting profile is the Condemner Stake, basically her combi weapon bolt gun with a stake launcher attached. This one appears to be similar to other combi weapons where it's just been rolled into one rapid fire profile, even if that's a bit weird. Rather than having anti-infantry 4 plus like the other combi weapons has though, this one's got anti psyker 2 plus on it, in addition to the precision and anti psyker 2 plus rule. It does look like you'd both be able to fire Castigation and that stake into a Psyker character within a unit, both at the same time. If you rolled very well, then that could be up to 5 mortal wounds on the character, which does seem fairly brutal. I guess that is against her ideal prey though, and you could certainly fail those hit rolls. Then I guess the rest of her value is made up of buffing her infantry unit. As I mentioned, she'd give them a 4 plus leadership, which is no small deal in 10th edition with Battleshock, I guess. That's a pretty decent improvement, even for Space Marines with a leadership 6 plus. Otherwise, though, she gives an interesting psychic debuff with her psychoculum. While this model's leading a unit, ranged attacks from that unit have the anti psycho 4 plus rule, so she could make a battle line unit considerably more deadly against psychic targets, wounding them very easily, even with small arms. Seems like that could be potentially quite nice targeting something like a demon primarch or a tyranid flyrant. Finally, she's got a rule called no escape. This one looks like it might be a 10th edition equivalent of the no fall back type rules that we've seen in 9th, but this one is a little bit different. Rather than just flat out preventing fallback, this one means that you have to test desperate escape when the enemy unit falls back from this squad, even if they're not battle shocks. That will seriously give your opponent a pause about doing that, as generally you lose about a third of your unit when you do so, so it's quite brutal. If they do happen to be also battle shocks, then they'll get a minus one to each of those rolls, basically losing half of the unit on average. I guess that one's kind of dependent on the enemy unit wanting to fall back away from you, and that might be a bit more likely to happen if she's joining some sort of dangerous melee unit, a lot of which might not be battle line. Still though, that could give the opponent a nasty choice, although they would always get the benefit of either choosing to fall back or stay in combat, whatever's more advantageous for them, plus it doesn't work on monsters and vehicles. Overall seems interesting enough, I'd say that maybe Greyfax doesn't seem to be enormously well-rounded, very skewed into killing psychic targets, sometimes your opponents just aren't going to have any of those. I guess if psychers do happen to be really dominant in the meta when 10th edition properly launches, she could be pretty interesting. Armies like Grey Knights and Thousand Sons will probably see her as bad news on the other side of the table. Otherwise, as well as Greyfax though, we've also got rules for the Standard Inquisitor. Again, he's a leader who'll be able to join any Imperium battle line unit, so buffs are kind of interesting here. Again, he's lost one wound, and he's only got a leadership of 6+, plus, so not quite as indomitable as Greyfax is. For ranged attacks, he's got a slightly different flavour of psychic attack. He's got a psychic shockwave with 2d6 auto hits at 18 inch range. These strike at strength 3 and AP minus 1, 
and they've also got devastating wounds, so sixes will be mortals. That feels like a fairly solid generalist profile there. It deals around about one mortal wound on average, and against any infantry, you might be stacking a few of AP-1 saves as well. Maybe not too dissimilar in damage outputs to how the old smite was. In addition to that, it looks like he also gets to strike with a standard issue combi weapon as well. Those ones having the similar sort of profile that we've seen previously. Though interestingly, for some reason, this one picks up AP-2, compared with the Space Marine ones that we've seen previewed that were AP-0. Again, though, it still has the anti-infantry 4+, plus and devastating wounds, so against infantry, a lot of the time, the AP won't matter. In combat, it's got some okay melee damage as well. Four attacks hitting on a 3+, plus with his force weapon at strength 5 and damage D3. Given that some of these look like they're war gear type choices, I'd guess it looks like he's still going to have the option to choose whether or not he's going to be a Psyker leading your forces, though I'd guess that the Psychic option might cost more points, seeing as it just seems to be basically flat better, as the Psychic Shockwave and the Force Weapon both look like improvements to me. It does appear though that he's probably lost a bunch of fun war gear choices that Inquisitors have had for a long time now, things like the Needle Pistol appear to be gone from this datasheet. I feel like Games Workshop need to get round to producing a generic Inquisitor kit at some stage, giving us some of those options back in plastic. Then, perhaps some of the most interesting things for the Inquisitor are the buffs that he gives his unit. Really quite interesting, as he could have it on any battle line unit, it would seem. One of his main things is the power of the Rosette. This one gives him a 3 plus chance to farm 1 command point when you're targeting his unit with a stratagem. Really quite a nice mechanic that should net you a few command points over the game, provided you are using him on a pivotal unit that's going to require those stratagems, so you probably want to have him leading something fairly big and scary. This one's definitely a powerful ability but I'd bear in mind that you can only farm a maximum of one command point per battle round. It does mean that if your faction's got other easy rules to allow you to do this, this might be a bit redundant and force you to target just one squad. Otherwise, he gives his unit a 5 plus fill no pain against mortal wounds. Definitely not a bad thing to have on your unit. It does seem in 10th edition that they aren't going to be going around quite as big as they used to be. Things like vehicle explosions, devastating wounds, and things like certain stratagems seem to be the main way that they get handed out. Definitely a nice to have, could be handy on a big durable battle line unit that could use the extra defence against mortals as they've already got good saves or invuls. Overall, I'd say the single biggest value out of him is potentially that command point farming. Most of the rest doesn't really seem to be enormously exciting to me, though not terrible to have I guess. If he's very cheap then he could well be worth it, if not then he's probably going to get passed up for things that are more meaningful. Next up we've got one of the rest of the new units in the Imperial Navy Breachers. These were the ones that came out at the start of the Kill Team Into the Dark Space Hulk run of box sets, and Games Workshop did give us their unit construction page as well, basically saying that they come with a few basic special weapon upgrades just as standard, they get the Endurance Shield and the Last Volley as standards, and it looks like you've still got the option to trade out a few of the other ones with different weapons like that Chain Fist, or swap the Last Volley for special weapons. On their stat line, maybe one of the biggest surprises is they've only got a leadership of 8+, plus. that's one of the worst ones that we've seen in 40k so far on par with Tyranids out of Synapse range. I guess that makes them just a little bit more dependent on having a leader around, which might or might not be a good idea. Otherwise, their stat line is fairly similar. They lost their Void Armor rule to worsen enemy AP as it comes in, and they are Objective Control too, so they are going to be quite good for fighting for and holding objectives, though they aren't battle line. The Breaches have got really quite a lot of weapons and war gear going on. A few of them have taken some of the normal 10th edition changes, losing AP or range, the shotguns have lost 6 inch range, but they have kept the assault keyword, not many things have that in 10th edition. The last volley has dropped down to 18 inch range, and it's lost its AP minus 1. It isn't a heavy weapon anymore though, so you can still fire it at ballistic skill 4 plus on the move. I think the demo charge looks pretty exciting, if you can get in range to use it. This one looks like it's the same profile as the Gene Stiller Colt Saboteur one that we saw. A fairly exciting one shot weapon with a big D6 plus 3 shots, all hitting at strength 12, AP 2 and damage 2. It's only 6 inch range, but you can potentially run and throw it with assault, and it does have the hazardous keyword as well, so there's at least a reasonable chance that the person throwing it gets caught in the blast. Otherwise, that endurance shield has a 4 plus invul save, in theory nice enough for tanking some high AP shots on, but at the same time you might not want to, as he's the one who bears the heavy shotgun that's got a boosted shooting profile, and one of the squad can take a grenade belt set if they want, that gives them the smoke keyword, so you could have cover and minus 1 to hit for 1 command point, and it also helps their grenade stratagem a little bit, you get to roll 7d6 and fish for those mortal wounds rather than the usual 6. Finally, their special rule seems to be a fairly common one for battle line type troops in other factions, even if these guys aren't. They get to re-roll wound rolls of 1 just innately on their datasheet, but against units on objectives they get to fully re-roll wound rolls, which is a pretty meaningful damage boost, and probably gets them from being a bit underwhelming in terms of damage to kind of efficient. 
That last bit in particular seems fairly scary with the demo charge. With strength 12 and that amount of shots, you could be getting a decent amount of wounds on tough vehicles. Overall seems fairly fun. I would be kind of surprised if they wind up being any particularly efficient tournament unit. Games Workshop usually try and keep their generic choices just a little bit more on the niche side. A bit underwhelming for hyper-optimised lists, but not unplayable for more fun and fluffy games. Finally last but by no means least we have the Vindicare Assassin, which I might try and follow up with another full video for. His abilities do seem kind of fun. The new versions of the Assassins seem to have a fairly similar stat line to previous, as with quite a lot of characters looks like he loses a wound, otherwise broadly similar, moves 7 inches, has a 4 plus invul save, still hits on 2s and has a toughness of 4. As I think Games Workshop teased before when they talked about Lone Operative, he does indeed have that completely unrestricted, so you just flat out can't target him greater than 12 inches, but you happily can if you get that close. He's also got Stealth, so he'll be minus 1 to hit at range, and he can set up in the mid-board if you want to, you could infiltrate him, say, onto a high ruin or something. He does seem potentially like one of the models that could be quite good for using that plunging fire type rule, set him up on high, and maybe get yourself an AP-4 Exeter's rifle for the rest of the game. It's also got the smoke keyword for the minus one to hit and cover stratagem, though in general with stealth that's not going to come into effect all that much unless the enemy's got positive modifiers. It seems that you can't deep strike him anymore, though I guess you could put him in strategic reserve, and finally he's got epic hero, which means that you can only take one of him. Of course the exciting bit for the Vindicare is his Exodus rifle. They generally tend to reinterpret this in quite a big way each time his rules have a full rewrite. Now it's a single shot weapon at strength 7, AP 3 and damage D3 plus 3. It hits on a 2+, plus, can snap characters with precision and has the devastating wounds and heavy keywords. Again I suppose heavy will only be relevant against 2 hit modifiers. If say you were just targeting an enemy leader that was out in the open, you'd usually have around about a 50% chance for those D3 plus 3 wounds. Really quite a scary threat there, as a lot of leaders only have 4 or 5 wounds these days, they definitely would have to worry about that, and also if you do spy a particularly valuable target with a good invul, once per game you can trigger his shield break around, you choose that before you've shot, and then for that particular shot with his Exeter's rifle, he can't take any saves whatsoever against that round. It's certainly relevant for invul saves, and also relevant for the armor saves as well, as you might have a 2 plus that could be saving on a 5 otherwise. Fairly scary stuff, though will often be wounding on a 3 plus, a lot of the time he is going to be rolling either a 1 to hit or a 1 or 2 to wound. It's only slightly better than a 50-50 chance there, and if the enemy has any save whatsoever, then that will go down further. Still seems pretty scary though, definitely not a threat that your opponent can ignore, and his Exeter's pistol does seem fairly brutal against heavy infantry up close, 3 shots at strength 5 and damage 3. Though if he is that close, then he's going to be targeted himself, and it's not really all that tough. Finally, his special rule is called dead shot, and this isn't going to come up all that often, but when you do roll hot and you roll a 6 to hit, you then add 3 damage to the characteristic of his attack, so that would be a massive d3 plus 6 damage, 8 damage if you can then go on to convert the wound. Definitely a big threat there, but you could certainly just fail to wound after that, or your opponent could pass their invul save if you've not used shield breaker. I feel like a lot of the time the Vindicare is going to be threatening a whole ton of damage, but it's just going to not happen. If you do get a critical hit though, the unit that's targeted must take a battle shock test at least, and that could be kind of annoying for your opponent I suppose. Overall seems kind of fun, but fairly unreliable. As with any unit, the points are really going to make the difference as to whether he's efficient or not, but I certainly feel with some armies with leaders, he is going to be very, very spooky, and might make you think very carefully about where you put your characters until he's neutralised. Overall, a fun little preview for the Agents of the Imperium, I feel. I'd say out of those preview rules, everything looks kind of interesting, but maybe not super overwhelming. I'd guess they'd probably be trying to aim to keep them how they are now, playable in-game, though not utterly dominant and also include in every single Imperium army. Greyfax seems really good if you know that you're going to be facing Psychers or they're really heavy in the meta. The standard Inquisitor at the right cost seems nice for the command point farming, though much less so if you've already got an ability that generates your command points as that would overlap. The Vindicare definitely seems like the most exciting thing here, but with a single shot and some big unreliability, he still might well be a unit that just seems a lot more threatening than he actually winds up being. Let me know your thoughts anyway, would you be tempted to include some agents in your Imperial army, and if so, which of these so far? If you've enjoyed the video, then feel free to subscribe to Allspets Tactics, where I'll certainly keep up with Games Workshop's news and rumours from their previews, I'm sure we'll get plenty more going into 10th edition. Finally, if you have been enjoying all the videos on the channel, and you'd like to help support, I would just like to mention that Allspets Tactics does have a Patreon page as well, and you can find that linked in the video description, down below the video. If you have been enjoying quite a lot, any support is enormously appreciated, and channel patrons do get some advantages, seeing certain videos early, 
regular votes to see what sort of things happen next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways with a chance to win some big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you, or you'd just like to help support, the link is down in the video description. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.